Uh, well, while we are getting ready to get started, I welcome everyone today afternoon to the onboard leadership panel. Uh, while we let everybody join the session, we have a quick video to introduce onboard to everybody in the session. Uh, and let's get started with the introduction. Welcome everyone and good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for today's onboard leadership panel, where we'll be discussing association board leadership and governance in the era of business as unusual. Before we start, I would like to thank all our participants for sending in their questions beforehand. We have an exciting discussion with a really expert uh, panel that is in store for you. But before we start a little housekeeping, uh, we do have live closed captions today uh, which you can uh, start by clicking on the closed caption uh, in your Zoom uh, panel. We also do have some live interpretation services, uh, which you can uh, avail of uh, by just pinning the video with our interpreter, Rihanna. Um, our regular housekeeping, we will be sending a recording of this session um, within the next 24 hours after the uh, session is completed. We do encourage everyone to participate in the polls as we go through the webinar. Uh, please feel free to put in any additional questions that you have for our panel within the Zoom panel Q&A uh, section. And for everyone that is attending the session live, there is an opportunity for you to earn one CAE credit uh, for attending the session. So do keep your registration email uh, as well as the follow-up email to the session uh, with you to ensure that you're able to avail it at the end of the session. With this, let me start by introducing Paru. Parun is the co-founder and CEO of Passageways. An uh, entrepreneur and a tech visionary, he serves on various boards that includes Passageways, Big Brother, Big Sisters of Greater Lafayette, Indiana University Simon Cancer Center, and TechPoint. Parun is going to be hosting the session today, and with that, I'll hand it over to him. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mo. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, Today, uh, we are going to be discussing a very relevant topic, I hope, um, 
as we cautiously move move forward, uh, you know, amidst all these different waves of COVID, uh, most associations are busy addressing a variety of uncertainties in their world and certainly through this planning cycle. As stewards and exemplars of their members, um, the question really is how are association boards and executives navigating through these scramble times? Today, I have a great panel with me today. It's my pleasure to welcome Susan Robertson, uh, Linda Patterson, Sharon Newport, and Johnny White uh, for this discussion. Uh, before we get going, I'm going to quickly go through uh, you know, some of the information about each one of them. Uh, Susan uh, obviously needs no introduction. She's the president and CEO of American Society for Association Execs. Uh, she oversees all the strategic and operational aspects of ASA, as well as ASA Research Foundation, and it's for-profit subsidiary ASA Business Solutions. Um, she's been there for 19 years and is a spokesman for the, for the association profession and the power of associations. Prior to her association work, she's worked at Ethan Allen, a store that I quite like, I must say, and it's international headquarters as a trainer and program developer. Welcome, Susan. Uh, and then we also have Linda Patterson, who founded AMPED Association Management back in 2008. I must say our panel has long tenures as CEOs and chief executives today. You'll see that pattern. Uh, Linda followed her passion for helping nonprofits operate effectively and grow to meet their goals. AMPD empowers volunteer leaders to lead rather than manage staff and operations. Uh, with over 25 years of experience as a CEO, Linda is a certified association exec and a fellow at the American uh, Society of Association Execs. Uh, she brings a lot to the table here uh, for our conversation. She's a planning expert, a speaker, an author, an entrepreneur. She obviously uh, also serves on the board of ASA. And as a volunteer, she's uh, involved in various association management company institute uh, activities as well. Welcome, Linda, as well. We also have Sharon Newport here with us. She's the interim chief executive for DHI, Door Security. Uh, and safety professionals, as well as for Door Security and Safety Foundation. Sharon has successfully led change and growth for over a decade in both organizations, passionate about the future, what the future holds for her members and the industry. She's also a certified association exec and a graduate of Georgetown University's uh, organizational development and uh, change leadership program. Uh, and then prior to becoming uh, an association exec, Sharon produced award-winning documentaries, uh, documentary films and, uh, and television for some of the channels that are my favorite channels with the three-year-old at home, Discovery Channel, Animal Channel, and the History Channel. Uh, and then uh, last but not the least, we have Johnny White, um, Chief Executive uh, and Executive VP of the American Society of Appraisers, uh, who's also actually been there for 30 years, uh, serving in a variety of management and leadership roles. In addition, uh, Mr. White also serves as, as an adjunct faculty of Georgetown University and uh, Northern Virginia Community College. Uh, he has done various volunteer leadership roles for ASAE and the Professional Conventional Management Association and received numerous awards and recognition for his work. Okay, with that out of the way, welcome panel. Thank you for being here today. Um, so to kick things off, I'm gonna start with a quick icebreaker here. Uh, we'll do a quick lightning round, just in a word, how do you feel about the current business environment? Susan? I feel smarter about it. Excellent. Linda? I feel invigorated. Awesome. Shannon? I feel very optimistic. Chris? Johnny? I feel, actually I want the two words, lessons learned from this current environment. Awesome. Let me give you the next word. All right, so next, you know, again, in a similar format, what are some of the ways your world has changed? personally, as well as professionally. We'll follow the same order. Susan, do you want to kick us off? 
Sure, be happy to. I think personally, I feel like I'm living a little out of balance. I used to think that when I traveled a lot, but now I think I've gone the opposite direction. And uh, professionally, I feel like um, we're creating some new rules. Excellent, Linda? Um, from my perspective, uh, like Susan, I, I traveled a lot, actually every week. So um, personally to be more deliberate about taking time, uh, I got a new set of golf clubs. And so that has been fun to get outside in the beautiful Wisconsin fall weather. Um, from a business perspective, I love that um, we have really been forced to embrace change and that has resulted in uh, faster decision making, um, risk tolerance increasing, especially for our boards that maybe, um, you know, had a lower level of, of risk tolerance in the past. Excellent. Shannon? Sharon? So personally, um, I, I too am settling into the pace of not traveling. And um, I, I, I can't say I, I do miss it, but I uh, wouldn't want to get back in that pace in this moment. So um, I am still adjusting to this COVID life. It is definitely out of my own rhythm, but I'm certainly enjoying being their family on a more regular basis. Um, professionally, I am very grateful that the value proposition for DHI has been able to do quite well in this environment. Certainly not as good as with, without COVID, but um, I'm, I'm grateful that we're able to pivot in the ways that we have, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get more into that. And so I think um, what it's done is it's uh, not only to Linda's point required some risk tolerance and uh, the ability to be more nimble, but I do feel, um, as I'd use my word as optimistic, because I think things we would wanted to try before we were just not quite ready to dare. And the fact that we did dare is now actually going to probably influence our future for years to come. Couldn't agree more. Johnny? Uh, just like the other panelists, I think all of us traveled uh, quite a bit. And so from a personal level, I, I, I enjoy the opportunity that I'm getting to spend more time with my family. I, I, you know, I joked about this the other day, uh, you know, as we think as kids, we had our cousins around. And then as we got older, we really didn't keep in touch with them. Well, I've probably been on multiple virtual happy hours with my cousins that I haven't talked to in years. So that's really good that I'm able to, you know, have that contact with family that I didn't have before. So from a personal level, that's great. From a professional level, you know, I think right now what's great about this is, uh, you know, being innovative is, is the appropriate time to incorporate that into your organization. Um, as we all have dealt with boards for many years, and when you talk about innovation, they're a little scared of that. They don't want to do, you know, a virtual board meeting or a virtual conference or anything like that. But now that they're forced into it and they see the benefits of it, it's really, um, turn uh, their, their uh, ideas on, on incorporating innovation. So that's a, a good thing from a professional standpoint. Excellent. Yeah, I do feel that these are scrambled times, but you know, lots of opportunities, lots of silver linings that I see as well. We go on with the rest of the program here. Uh, at this point, I think there's a quick audience poll uh, and we'll give everybody about 30 seconds to go through these questions. The first question is what percentage of your staff were or are working remotely as we stand today? And then what percentage of your staff do you anticipate will still work remotely uh, for the first half of next year, so next two quarters? And the third question, has the pandemic accelerated adoption of digital technologies in your organization? We'll give it just a minute. Okay. Uh, so here are the results. Uh, 75 to 100% actually are working remotely. Uh, so 77% actually, excuse me, 77% of the audience is actually really working remotely at this point. 5% uh, are actually really, uh, in some hybrid mode. And then what percent of the staff anticipate will be working remotely in the next two quarters? Again, 61% anticipate things to stay remote for the next six months. And lastly, uh, this is a 
you know, I think we are leading the witness here a little bit, but the pandemic certainly has accelerated digital technologies and the adoption there, 92%. Okay, that sets the stage. We kind of know where most people are on this. So let's get to the first question here. Uh, this is a question that I'll ask all the panelists. I won't do that for every question. It tends to get repetitive often, uh, but we'll go around this time around. Uh, the first question is, uh, you know, how has the landscape changed for the association industry in your eyes? We'll start with Susan. Uh, so much has changed. It's hard to pick out um, just one or two things. I think all of us know our, our entire backdrop, our entire environment has changed, but Here's the thing that I, I see as uh, really hopeful uh, for all associations is I think we all know associations get accused sometimes of being a little bit slow to react, uh, slow to make decisions. Uh, what I've seen is just the opposite in this environment. Um, associations have been quick to react. Um, they've had the good sense and uh, experience to listen closely to their members and to be disruptive of their own processes and ways of delivering content and programming. Um, it's much more about relevancy. It's much more about being on time with the kind of information that an industry or profession needs to get through this. So I have seen uh, associations really turn on a dime and kind of disrupt that notion that we are not as, as nimble as we, we might be. We are nimble. And I think that's going to be something that stays with us, that ability to, um, to do things quickly, quicker, and to be more impactful. And uh, that gives me a great deal of hope. Excellent. What about you, Linda? Uh, so although for many of us, our number one uh, member benefit and value is our annual conference or annual meeting, obviously that has uh, shifted for probably all of us. Uh, so one thing that this has done, I think just from a broad association industry perspective, uh, that this pandemic has really driven uh, a greater value for associations and the association memberships. I see that across all, you know, 19 of our association clients, regardless if their industry is doing well, like the air filtration industry, or if it's completely shut down, like the motor coach industry. Uh, so associations are there to uh, provide, as Susan said, timely information, uh, benchmarking, what are other people going through in my region, in the country, in the world that are in my business. So, you know, just as we did the polling and benchmarking, that is, you know, another great benefit of associations. And so I think it's, you know, that coupled with not having to be perfect, uh, but rather be timely. Uh, so not overthinking and over planning and over evaluating ha has actually, as I said, um, increased the value of associations, regardless of the industry or profession. Brilliant, love that. What about you, Sharon? Yeah, all really great points. You know, I, I've, prior to the pandemic in a conversation with another association exec colleague um, would often toss around the metaphor of associations being like big, beautiful yachts. We have lots of people on board. We, we do things very well, it's a good time. Um, but we weren't necessarily very nimble, at least in reputation, and that we were needing to become, you know, more like smaller ships that were, could run those waters much quicker. And here we are, and we're doing a great job. I also think that our members and our audiences are, um, to the point about being timely, um, they're much more forgiving of us trying things right now. They want to see us trying these things. They want to see us giving them these new options and these new ways to engage. And while we have to do our very best to be, you know, top notch with it, um, timeliness and delivery at the point of need seems to be the urgency. And then the other thing I was going to share is I, I think urgency um, can also also be the mother of invention and certainly the the premise for forgiveness in these moments, right? So if they're seeing us try something that is just far and beyond, and then even some cases perhaps changing a member benefit in order to save something for the association in order to do something more later. Um, I, I think that a lot of that um, is, is being allowed now from our members in our industries. And I also think that the association profession is in a fantastic job in our history. We're very good at sharing knowledge with one another, um, but often our members are so busy 
then it can sometimes be hard to pick up the phone and get some data from them. And I find that they're very interested in making sure we know what's going on with them so that we can meet those needs in a really different kind of way this time. So that's encouraging. Excellent. I agree. Actually, it's a great time to be able to try new things out quickly. What about you, John? Uh, I think there's three things that I'll bring up in terms of what I'm seeing uh, different with the association industry. Uh, one is uh, adoption to technology. Um, again, I think uh, for a lot of the organizations, you know, the association has been around for uh, hundreds of years, some of them. And um, they were just a little afraid to adopt some of the technology. But again, now that we were forced into having to do something different, we had to bring in these technologies, you know, such as, uh, you know, as we see with our annual conferences now, being virtual. Like, I think, you know, if you talk to a board member a year ago, they would have never thought about doing anything from a, a hybrid or a virtual standpoint. So I think adoption of technology is changing with the landscape. Another thing is um, thinking short-term rather than long-term. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, um, prior to us starting the, this uh, panel about how we're looking at our financial uh, statements. We're looking more of a short term. Right? We Cash is king for us. So we want to ensure that we have enough cash to cover our expenses. So we're looking at that. Not that we're not looking at long term, but we're, we have a, a more focused view on our short term, uh, especially when it comes to cash. And then the last thing I would say is um, collaboration. I, I will say, you know, especially at the beginning of this pandemic, there was a lot of collaborations among the associations were at one point were competitors. I think we all saw that it was better for the profession if we worked together, because as we know, if we're all steering um, the boat in the right, right direction, it, it is a benefit for everyone that's in that profession. So, you know, my organization with a lot of other organizations started to come together from an advocacy standpoint, from an education standpoint. Um, and I think that's gonna continue to um, be the way that we're gonna be working um, in this new landscape. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I agree. Uh, and, you know, we are seeing a lot of different, uh, you know, trajectories to different associations here. Some associations find themselves in uh, sectors that have gotten accelerated. Uh, certainly, Donnie, you look like uh, to be in one of those sectors uh, where appraisers have actually seen a lot more business and certain other associations have actually seen, uh, you know, an entirely different environment that they find themselves in. Uh, all great points. We're going to move on to the next question here. And this question is more about uh, the role of the board. Uh, so um, it's, it's a two-part conversation here. Uh, and I'm going to actually you know, uh, let you answer both the questions. Uh, in, in, you can mix up the answer as well. First, what role has the board played in managing and planning during this crisis? And then secondly, how will the board, uh, board's role transform in the post-COVID world? Uh, you know, uh, for this question, I'll toss it uh, to Linda first. Okay, uh, thank you. So in addition to being the president and owner of AMPT Association Management, I am the CEO of our largest client, which is America's Committee on Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis. Uh, and I, I share that because that's my perspective. That's, um, you know, the board that I work most closely with, uh, a board that is um, very strategic um, and, um, you know, has helped the organization grow. It's actually an organization I um, helped found. I was their first uh, staff person in 2009, and we have grown to a $13 million organization. Uh, so, uh, we went into this with the luxury of having a board that was very strategic and, um, you know, we pulled in, especially the officers on more of our, you know, decision making specifically to take a citywide meeting uh, completely virtual timing of that uh, daily conversations with, you know, the convention center and host hotels. Uh, trying to figure out, you know, what that was going to look like. So I will say from a CEO perspective, I really appreciated that because this was a, a huge decision, a big risk for us given um, the, the timing of that. Uh, their role also through all of this and continues to be a good benchmark for us. What's happening um, in their institutions, they're mostly academic. Uh, so we're regularly, um, you know, asking them 
you know, what do their travel restrictions look like? How far, you know, is that going out? Down to, um, you know, much more strategic things for the association long term. So it's interesting for me to see the tactical support. Um, we're really good about, you know, kind of debriefing on our scenario planning and decision making so that we can carry that moving forward. Um, and I think, you know, another thing that was a little bit of a surprise is that, you know, this group is just um, highly professional, very business focused, as I said, very strategic. Um, I saw like a softer side, a more personal side. They're, they're great to work with, but, you know, kind of people that we're seeing, you know, in society sort of checking in with one another and taking time for that. Uh, and then I think, as I said at the beginning, um, getting comfortable, taking risks, measuring our risks, being able to say, if we do this, here are the potential outcomes. If we do this, here's how much and, you know, what that may look like uh, and, and really sharing in that together. Um, and then, you know, finally continuing on with our scenario planning as we move forward. Very good. Yeah, uh, next, you know, if you don't mind, Susan, could you, uh, given your unique vantage, uh, you know, uh, vantage point, could you share your comments on, you know, how you've seen the role of the board shape up and how do you see it going forward in the post-COVID world? Well, I think it's hard to add anything to what Linda's covered because certainly she's representing what, what we're seeing in terms of boards reacting and, um, and being closer to the organizations that they're responsible for. You know, speaking for the ASAE board, you know, we have a unique situation in that all of our board members run their own associations or some part of the industry that supports associations. So they have a, a unique vantage point. But the good thing for us is that it, it brought, it, they bring their own stories and their own expectations to the table, which really does help ASAE be more responsive to general needs of the association community. So I, I look to our board to be a true reflection of, of what is needed in the conditions of our, of our community right now. So that's, that's a really important role. And it's not to say that the board hasn't always played that role, but it was less urgent. You know, when, when an organization is as mature as ASAE is, with a business model as mature as ASAE's was, it's very easy to just say everything's fine. And I think up until the point that we faced some, not just the COVID tragedy, but we, we lost our CEO uh, to, uh, to cancer. There were just a lot of things that happened at ASAE that were incredibly disruptive and all in a row. And so um, nobody was comfortable all of a sudden. You know, this was a lot of change that we were dealing with. And I think the board has uh, stepped up and done uh, one thing that I think is really important to support the launch of a strategic plan, which seemed a little crazy uh, once COVID hit. We thought, what are we doing? But actually it's been one of the smartest things that we've done. Um, it does um, put a whole new layer of work on top of the organization, but it's, it's given us a vision for ASAE that is longer than just when this COVID crisis lifts, it's going to be a three-year plan. And, and so well worth the effort. And we've been working hand in hand with the board to create that plan. And so they're very supportive of it and they're also very involved in it to make sure that it really does reflect the current needs of, of our community. Um, so I think, you know, going to the question about how the board's role will transform post COVID, I think we've been well on our way to that for a while. And I get the sense from other association executives that their boards are doing the same. We've adapted to a new way of working together um, a new way of communicating. Certainly, I think we miss the, the closeness that a board feels when they can meet in person and exchange ideas. I think that makes things even richer, but we're all doing fine um, with, with the, the platforms that we've been given and the way in which we have to run the organization. I mean, the last thing that I would say is that um, overall, I would say the, the board is much more engaged and much more uh, tolerant of, of risk as, as Linda pointed out. Um, we have not been taking a lot of risks with the exception of a couple of programs over the years. Now there are lots of little risks that add up to big ones. And so we have to, to look at that as our future because that's where the growth opportunities are. And we're not always going to succeed and we don't have time to get it perfect. So the last point I'd make is that the board has I believe developed and will develop more tolerance for imperfection because this environment doesn't allow for much of it. And so, um, you know, knowing that we're going to try some new things and we're going to fail fast and we're going to uh, rebound quickly, 
um, is much more a part of our vocabulary than it once was. So hope that answers your question. It does. Uh, I learned a lot, actually. Uh, you know, little background there. When we were working with your team for the endorsement, you know, that's when all of this happened. And, you know, it was actually interesting to see the communication that we are getting, the interaction that we're getting. And now it's, you know, it's good to see that things are, you know, where we are. We've, you know, we've helped so many customers join. I'm pretty proud of what we put together here recently. In fact, uh, congratulations to you for, you know, uh, for what you've been doing here. And I can tell from Linda's nodding there since she's on the board that things seem to have fallen into a good, uh, you know, posture there. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, just on one thing, and I know you have a great audience of uh, association executives out there, and I just want to cautious caution them as you're as in any crisis planning, you have different roles, um, and the board's role is to they're the strategy. They and I think Linda uh, coined it right. I mean, they know what's going on in the industry because you know those are their colleagues, their members. So they're going to come to you as the uh, experts are understanding what's happening in this environment. And then as you as the uh, association executive, the CEO is going to plan your operations around that. Um, one thing that we have to be careful with, uh, again, and this is advice, is that you don't want your, especially during a crisis standpoint, have your board down in the operations and start making decisions. Because if that happens, they will never come out of that, that role. Um, so you want to be sure that you keep them at that strategy role um, and you're, you're, they're, they're your sounding board, you're getting information from them, and then from the operation standpoint, you're carrying out those type of things. So we just got to keep that in mind as we're in, in this situation. Excellent point there, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we are rewriting the communication a little bit, you know, but we uh, need to actually be mindful of how we are doing that and for how long and certainly make sure that, you know, uh, we uh, keep the sanctity of, uh, you know, what the board truly represents. It's the inner sanctum that's available to the chief executive. Uh, if you, uh, you know, dilute some of that and there's too many instructions going the other direction, it becomes a, a difficult thing to manage. Lots of experience there myself, actually. It brings about several stories. We'll move on to the next question here. This is about board interactions. Uh, so uh, we're going to actually really think through, uh, you know, various different you know, aspects of the board interaction, the technology you're using, the frequency at which you're, uh, you know, meeting, the quality of the engagement and so on. The question is, how have the interaction between the board and the leadership and the staff evolved during this pandemic? Have you kept your board on the same sort of meeting cadence, uh, you know, the pre-COVID cadence? And then also, have you done anything differently to engage virtually with your board? Uh, again, I'm going to actually, you know, ask just a few of you guys. But if you have other, you know, observations here, please, please, uh, please feel free uh, to jump in. So this question is for Sharon. So I'll mix my answer as we're doing here. Um, our interactions have completely changed, um, and uh, I, I think we've hit a good stride with it. So. What we looked like pre-COVID was um, certainly regular communications as well as quarterly reports that included reports from all the senior management team and, um, and regular email updates as needed on various things and creating um, engagement with the finance committee a little further. Um, we've had uh, not only COVID, but a number of other changes that have created organizational transition for us over the last year. And what became immediately understandable is that instead of having what was traditionally a spring in-person board meeting and a fall in-person board meeting based on our fiscal year and our planning schedule, um, one, that wasn't gonna happen, but also two, the fact that we were able to go virtual and there was a need to talk more often. And in the beginning, we were one of the many organizations working through cancellations and having several right in those first 30 days that we needed to address 45 days um, when everyone's at, you know, immediately working from home is uh, let's do regular one hour to 90 minute updates at least once a month, maybe once every 45 days or so as we get ourselves through this. And um, so to Johnny's point earlier, looking at cash, looking at the implications, how can we mitigate, what can we do to navigate, um, still thinking at that point in the year that, gosh, maybe by summer, <laughs> we'll all be coming back together. You know, we didn't really know for a while how long this might last. Um, 
So going to a format that allowed for quick updates, but very top of mind, where are the finances and what's going on with cash and how are we operationally pivoting and them making requests of staff to say, I think we should create the opportunity for say, in-person instructor led learning, no more schools. We actually conduct two schools a year. We do a lot of things that are in-person education by classes and we bulk them together for a great in-person experience. Let's try it online, instructor led, let's make it happen. You know, my members are door security and safety professionals. So they like touching the pieces and the parts, but there's a lot of education that can happen in that way. And we had to be willing to give it a shot. Um, and we did so in a measured way and it's actually proven really successful. So shorter interactions, more frequent. We went to a PowerPoint format that was like presentational. We built a dashboard presentation quickly and started to move into data stats, data stats, and then narrative. One of the things that we could not done, have done without moving to this virtual format is bringing many more committee chairs to the table, giving committees a chance to get a little more engaged and provide updates directly to the board rather than via staff. So again, let that engagement level became very important for all of the levels of our system and in a way for the board to say, gosh, you know, usually, at least in our case, I would say, usually they'd say, we didn't know you were doing that much. That's really great. We're glad to hear that. <laughs> you know, and you want, you want that to be part of the reaction, not because you're keeping anything hid, but because you want them to be pleasantly surprised at quite how much is going on with all of those committees behind the scenes and that the work continues. Um, and it has been able to continue more nimbly because of the virtual environment. Um, and I would say that the board is now more engaged and actually, I don't wanna say ask less questions because the questions are just simply different, um, but they seem to have the data they need to feel comfortable to make these risky decisions. And that from a staff perspective is really good to see. And I think that's where some of that um, urgency and forgiveness, as I would say, would come in because they wanna see us try it. And luckily, knock wood, uh, we're, we're doing okay so far, but I know we have a ways to go in this climate. And do you think you'll go back to the, um, the older cadence once things calm down a little bit? It's a great point. I actually don't think we will. I'm certain we'll go back to in-person board meetings, no question, just like we'll go back to in-person meetings. Um, and in fact, we're going to try some of that next year in pretty measured ways. Um, but I do think the fact that we've been able to create really nice engagement with pretty little lift compared to what it would feel like to plan like a four day board meeting, <laughs> you know, a 90 minute board meeting, a 60 minute update with some engagement online um, has been really effective. And so I actually look forward to keeping that as part of the process, maybe not quite as regularly um, as time moves on and things evolve, but I do think that's gonna be one of the things that changes interaction for some time to come. That's great. Linda? Um... Do you mind sharing some more thoughts around this topic and how is your experience been? So from my experience, um, you know, this pandemic and the, um, you know, decisions we're forced to make quickly um, did result in our board meeting more frequently and oftentimes on uh, single topic agendas. Uh, so that really resulted in, um, um, you know, less of the reporting out and more of like deep discussions, evaluating decisions, uh, Sharon, to your point, uh, you know, it's something that I resist in terms of that line between governance and operations. And, um, but we found, you know, we really, for the size meetings and the cancellation fees, you know, potentially we were looking at to sort of have them in, in our court. And another thing that some of the, you know, these things are happening, I'm like, is this really happening? Did we really invite our board chair to join our staff calls Wednesday mornings for the first, it was like, that would never, I would never. But I found myself, um, you know, Dr. Cohen would be calling me twice on Friday, twice on Saturday, twice on Sunday, like, how are we, do we have a decision yet? Where are we in this? You know, I'm like, I have to check with so-and-so, so-and-so. So that, you know, he, he doesn't still, now that we're over the big hump, but it actually proved to be so much more efficient for all of us. I think it gave him insights into what we were dealing with, but we were able to, you know, connect with him on, I mean, whether it's, 
you know, COVID in their labs and their clinics and how it's affecting patients with MS and how that will, you know, spill over into the program uh, to, you know, some of those, those other areas, but also, um, you know, we're testing out new technology. Um, I just was interviewed for an article yesterday and I said, you know, looking at these platforms, I feel like the number one criteria is the, the speaker component, right? Like speaker training, the speaker experience. The, um, and so to have, you know, Dr. Cohen to be sort of inside as we're looking at that because we're not the ones delivering, you know, the plenary sessions, the scientific talks. So we, again, multiple times for every one of our clients, we have a decision matrix that essentially outlines, um, you know, in a one pager, the role of the board, the executive committee staff, where we're making decisions. And literally we would pull that thing out. It's like, wow, it's spilling over, but it was us, you know, ensuring that we had that awareness. Um, in terms of the full board, another thing that, you know, I found is that we were doing more um, sort of intermittent updates. Here we are on this, um, we expect to make a decision by this date, just so that they knew kind of what was coming down the pike. Uh, so I think that was, you know, that's not something we would typically do. Um, so again, I think the, the single topics, um, you know, much more focused makes you realize, you know, how many years ago did we introduce the consent calendar? And that was like a big deal back then. Well, now it's sort of, you know, I've always been wanting to rewrite Robert's rules and modern rules anyway, um, making sure that we maintain, you know, their role as the board, but um, it's allowed for some pretty rich discussions and um, good connectedness with our board. Excellent, that's brilliant. One of the companies that everybody should look up on this topic is Netflix. In fact, Netflix uh, reimagining the board meeting is an article that's very popular on the web. Some of you guys may be familiar. This touched uh, a nerve here because Linda mentioned how the chairman is actually involved in some of the staff meetings just you know, sporadically. Netflix makes it a point that every uh, executive leadership team meeting has two board members as observers and they rotate those board members just to provide the context uh, and that context then actually leads to better results in the boardroom. There's lots of fascinating things that they do, but this certainly stands out as something that's you know, worth trying, even in my book. Uh, we are actually uh, gonna pick up the pace here a little bit and we'll get on to the next topic here. Uh, the next topic is actually about strategic planning. Uh, we all have different planning cycles here. Uh, you know, certainly in recent times, uh, this has been an important, uh, you know, part that we, we had to think about. So we're going to talk about a little bit about what scenarios are you and your board thinking about and modeling about going forward? And then what insights or tips can you share on guiding your boards back to thinking long-term strategy after, uh, of course, you know, uh, the current crisis gets done as we've all been too focused towards the short run here. And on this topic, uh, you know, uh, Susan, can you uh, share your thoughts first? Sure. Thank you. Um, and I will keep this brief. Scenarios are really important. And I think the primary one that everybody is looking at are if thens with finances. You know, what if revenue drops to this? What if revenue drops to that? You know, it depends entirely on uh, the industry or profession that you serve. As some of my colleagues have said, some are doing very well because they are extremely engaged in, um, in frontline activities or in recovery activities. And so it varies widely, but I would say for the majority of associations that I'm aware of, including ASAE, we have to look at the financial key factor and plan around it. Um, you know, what triggers would we have um, financially should uh, we have a loss of revenue that would be um, greater than we think or we predict at this time. And that's very dependent on face-to-face uh, and the return of face-to-face. -face. And at the same time, we're looking at that and, and our inability to execute against it and some unknowns with hybrid meetings and the success, particularly the financial success of hybrid meetings because there's a completely different cost structure that's applied to a hybrid meeting than a one channel meeting, either virtual or live. And so it's really like planning two conferences 
Um, those are the scenarios we're looking at. In the positive sense, though, the scenario that we know we must um, do better at and do more of is how we create an experience for our members online. Their virtual reality with us, however we touch them with online learning, with virtual webinars and just-in-time programming, and how they interface with us on our various web properties is a primary focus right now because that's where the game is. That's how people are gonna connect with us and have meaningful experiences. We've introduced a new product um, management function at ASAE so that we're looking at um, what will drive recovery as well as revenue as our, our first priority as we work through these various scenarios. Um, your second question about insights or tips, you know, this is where ASAE has kind of this unique role. We're usually looked at to be the model or to lead, to know the answers. And I'll tell you, I think we all know that none of us have a, a, a game plan or a playbook for what we've experienced. And none of us expected it to last this long. I mean, let's be honest. We really thought that we'd be in and out of this in a relatively brief period of time. And let's just say brief means months, not weeks. Although weeks had, had been a scenario of mine for a while, not any longer. Um, so we've kind of divested ourselves of that because we're trying to find our own way. But the thing that we have found and that helps the board focus on strategy, both long and short term, is learning from each other. As we've been going through this planning process and we've been marrying our, our strategic direction with the culture that we're, we're building internally so that we can execute on that plan um, you know, right when we're done with it. Uh, the board has been teaching each other parts of that plan. Uh, they've been advocates for it, they've given input into it. And so it isn't a one way ASAE staff is saying to the ASAE board, here's the direction. The ASAE board is saying to each other, this is the direction that we need to take. And that peer to peer learning is really pervasive throughout our programming this year. And I think that will last with us uh, going forward. And I think that really helps the board focus on what's really important to ASAE um, and important to each other as members of ASAE. Um, so it's something that we relied on and I think successfully through this period of time. So um, that's kind of where we are. And um, I would just say one thing that the opportunity here is to rework and create new rules for the relationship of, of an organization to its board and have that be much closer and finer grained without crossing that line that Johnny pointed out, which I agree, you don't want them in your operations. You want them in their, stra in, you want your board in your strategy. And uh, so far so good with what we're doing. Excellent. Uh, uh, Linda, do you have anything to add to it? Sure. Um, we have really used this as an opportunity and luckily from a financial perspective, we have run, um, some really profitable virtual meetings. Uh, so we have that luxury in terms of how can we use what we've learned and experienced to really build upon this. And one major area that our board um, is really reflecting on is around our DEI initiatives. And so we have found uh, through experience that um, you know, we, by offering, you know, high quality virtual meetings, we're removing barriers of time, travel, and cost to be a part of the association, uh, to present at an international conference, to have the opportunity to be peer reviewed, to be mentored. Um, so it really has opened up for us uh, some of the goals that we've had as an organization uh, to be much more inclusive, to um, offer even more opportunities to have young investigators or, you know, people who may be interested in going into neurology or MS specifically. Uh, so that has been really exciting and thinking about, you know, being really deliberate about what are the things that in-person can replace and what can't they? And looking at different demographics of, you know, who would be more likely to, you know, be the first to attend uh, a meeting live. And frankly, it's not most of our board members. They're very happy not to be flying across the world, but maybe there'll be an opportunity for us to bring um, young people and use our resources to support that in some kind of a, a hybrid fashion. So, you know, in short, I think just looking at the things that the opportunities that this has provided us and build upon those. And I think we'll be able to build business and financial models uh, to support that as well. Excellent. There was a question about DEI 
um, stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion. I should point out, having gone virtual, the supply of board talent is suddenly actually gone exponential. And that's also true for your staffers. And this is a great opportunity for all of us to think about it and see, you know, if we need to uh, make some changes, this is a great time to do that. Uh, in keeping, uh, you know, the timeline here in mind, we'll switch into the second audience poll here. Uh, this question is about what is the future of the board meetings and the engagement uh, as, we, as we think about the future. This is a quick little poll. Uh, we'll give people just a moment to answer this. Do they feel that the board meetings and engagement is going to happen in person or virtually, or it's going to be a hybrid? We'll let people answer this in just a, another five seconds here. Okay, good. Uh, let's see what we get. Aha. Uh -huh. 70% feel that this is going to be hybrid. I bet this question would have been answered very differently pre-COVID. Um, I talk about COVID here in, in this discussion. We should you know, also mention that we continue to see several different forces come together. It's not just COVID. Uh, you know, there is a you know, the day of racial reckoning that we all actually kind of just came head to head with as well. Uh, and then you know, there's obviously a recession, maybe an uh, you know, extended recession. I hope it's not anything more than that that's going on as well. Anyway, we'll move on to the next section here. I bet this is the most important section for most of the audience today. Uh, this pertains to member engagement and annual events. Uh, the question really is, do you believe the pandemic has permanently changed how associations will engage their membership going forward? And if so, how and why? And then also, have you seen success stories in associations reallocating funds to technology to better support virtual environments? And if so, what are some common investments you are seeing? I'm gonna ask this question first to Johnny and then see if Sharon has to add something to it. Uh, thank you, Perun. And wow, you gave me the, I guess you said the most important question. So hopefully I got the most important, uh, most important answer here. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, uh, you know, what I'm seeing in terms of changes for engagement and membership, I think Sharon um, touched on it and it's communication. I think uh, the associations are doing a better job of in communicating with their members. Um, and I think it, it was, it was the right time to do that um, because as we see with everybody, Everybody wanted information. So associations became a source um, for that information because there was so much stuff out there, you know, from uh, as you look at, you know, the different categories of, of our members, you know, those are members who are unemployed. Uh, there were members who were furloughed and there was a members who were overworked. So, you know, how do they navigate all these different things? So I think associations stepped up and became a curator of all this information. I think all of us said, and uh, put something on the website that was COVID related um, and any information that would benefit our members, we were putting there. So we became a source, a great source um, for our members. And then uh, as you heard from other panelists, I think we did a lot more um, communicating um, and that it created more engagement, you know, from doing, uh, I think, you know, a couple of uh, examples here is, is uh, you know, monthly um, tippet stories that went out. You know, I did, I was doing more uh, CEO messages to our members, our board. We were actually putting messages together for our board to send out to our members because they just really wanted to know what was going on with the organization. How is the organization helping them through this time? So I think as we come out of that, I think that's going to continue. Um, to increase that engagement with our members is increasing our communication to them. Um, so I think that's kind of the, the key uh, or the thing that I've seen change. And I think that's going to be you know, something that we're going to see again uh, moving forward, that increase uh, communication. Now, in terms of reallocating funds, uh, I think uh, Linda um, alluded to this. And we're seeing it too, and I'm seeing this across the board. Um, our programs, you know, we've switched them all to virtual. Um, but we're seeing a different profit from them. For some cases, our profit is actually more because um, you don't, if you think about it, an in-person meeting, you have all those uh, expenses such as, you know, from hotel, travel, and so forth. For a virtual, you don't have that. When you have your, your cost for the virtual platform, whatever you're using there, um, if you uh, 
provide an honorarium to the speakers, you have that. Um, and then you have the, 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 the staff's uh, resources there, but that's kind of uh, a fixed cost. So you don't have all those, those uh, direct expenses that you would have in person. So we're seeing uh, more profit coming out of these, these programs. So what do you do with that profit is you invest it into the technology. And for our example, you know, for our virtual conference, we really found a, a platform that we thought would be uh, perfect for our audience. Now it cost us a little bit more, but we knew that our profit was gonna be a little bit better. So that's why we invested in that. And then uh, as we look at the future and our future is short-term versus in uh, long-term, um, we know that this is working in somewhat sense, meaning doing virtual uh, programs. So we need to have a platform that's gonna be able to sustain that. So we're looking at our technology across the board, you know, looking at our associated energy management system, looking at our learning management system and so forth to see, is this the platform that's going to help us from now into the future? Um, because as we come out of this and you, know, you put up that question about uh, in-person, online, and hybrid. I think initially we're going to see a lot of hybrid. I think that first to second quarter of next year is mostly going to be hybrid. I think maybe third to fourth quarter will, will I mean, I'm sorry, first to second quarter is going to be more virtual. The third to fourth quarter is going to be more of that hybrid. I don't think we're going to see a true in-person program in that third to fourth quarter. Again, that's my opinion. There's a lot of things that's take, I mean, coming in place from the vaccine to uh, rapid testing that's going to expedite this process, but we do have individuals that I think are just either not gonna take a vaccine or they're just too scared to travel. So they're gonna really wanna be in that hybrid um, um, type of platform. So we have to have uh, technology in place to order to support that. So that's what I see investments going into. Good, yeah, it could be a competitive advantage regardless because not everybody's gonna be able to actually make that happen. Uh, anything to add to that, Sharon? No, no, well covered, Johnny. The only thing I'll, I'll just kind of bring together that was already mentioned, um, Linda brought up a great point around DEI and Johnny's point to communications. I'll just marry those two briefly and say that um, your members online experience with you matters and it's an opportunity to create equity. It's an opportunity to create inclusion, which will in will create diversity. And I think wielding what that experience looks like, feels like through your technology platforms and your communications, bringing all of those things together, I think that's a, um, an investment that will pay off way past 21 um, that we'll start to see as we move forward into future years. Brilliant. I believe these are not just values, they add value as well. On that note, we'll jump to the next question here. We are a little short in time. This question is about the era of business as unusual uh, what are some long-term impacts that you foresee for associations? And in your opinion, what role do associations fulfill in this uh, new era and, and any opportunities that associations can leverage to support their communities and membership? I'm going to ask this question to, uh, to Susan. Susan, you're on mute, I think. <laughs> Like many of you, we're having some work done in our house. And so I was trying to avoid the drill sound. <laughs> um, so the long-term impacts, you know, there are probably many, but I think one of the positive impacts long-term is that we will change our business models and get a whole lot more creative about how we offer programming to our members and how relevancy comes first in the decision tree, not, not somewhere in the middle. Does it make a difference? Will it have an impact? Is it worth somebody's time? Those are the longer term impacts that I, I see. In addition to that, I think it's how we come back to face-to-face -to -face is a longer term impact. We have to think very carefully now about how, what our members expect from a face-to-face -face encounter with us. You know, Some of the conferences that we've had might change. Uh, smaller, more boutique-like, more intimate kinds of gatherings are probably more the norm out of the gate. Um, how does that look vis-a-vis the virtual world that we've created and will probably sustain. Those are questions that I think will impact us further down the line as, as the gravity and the impact of this whole crisis becomes more evident. Um, I think there'll be a lot more contingency planning going forward. I don't see a day where we have a single plan without any options or thoughts about what might happen, the if then of it. So I think that's always going to impact how we see our long-term as well as our short-term planning. Um, and then a lot of this is dependent on an individual association's strength going forward. And I do mean financial strength, what reserve position an association has for how long
can we sustain this and what kinds of decisions and options uh, need to be made that will have a longer term impact. Um, and those are the hard questions right now is, you know, what levers do you pull in order to really get through this and see the light of day on the other side? You know, what really matters right now? As leaders, there's a tremendous amount of pressure to make those decisions and to advise the board with the very best of your knowledge and data that you can possibly um, advise and, and to also seem to be somewhat confident in those decisions when some of us are like, oh my gosh, I, I have all of these other questions. But, um, you know, I think business is unusual is a really great title for this because this is the unusual time. Um, but that's how I see it. And I think the long-term impacts are both really positive and um, possibly risky. Last thing I would say is this, is if we were honest with ourselves, we would realize that this crisis has probably exacerbated changes that we knew we need to make, make anyway. That there were things that we have been putting off, uh, whether they were staff decisions or program decisions, we had just flat out not done some of that stuff. And now we have to. So that sense of urgency and that sense of doing is right on us. And I think that's positive, quite frankly. So last, that's yeah. my last thought. Love that. Yeah, scarcity tends to drive focus, certainly. We're going to get to the last question here. It's just a very short question. As we look ahead to the future, I'd like a couple of you guys to share a prediction or two uh, that you think will come true by the end of 2021. I'll first toss it to Johnny and then let Linda bring us home here. Thank you. Share a prediction or two today that you think will come true by the end of 2021. I will be on a plane. No. Uh, <laughs> I will travel again. I think, um, I think what we'll see uh, by the end of 2021 is, and I kind of alluded to this in, in when I was talking about technology, um, we're going to see a lot of hybrid events, um, especially at, towards that third and fourth quarter. Um, and, then, and that's going to help us transition to this in-person um, and, and transition safely to this in-person because, you know, as we have uh, a number of these venues that we're working with, hotels, convention centers, and so forth, um, they have to prepare themselves to bring in the crowds. And, and initially, we're not going to be able to have very large meetings. So you got to slowly do that. So by doing a hybrid, we'll see that. So I think we'll see a lot of lessons learned by the end of 2021. And then as we go into 2022, we'll start to see, you know, some normal state of, you know, in-person travel back and, and things of that nature. Excellent. Linda? So my crystal ball since last uh, April, May, June was that this is a 24 month deal. So I've been telling my staff, you know, seven down, 17 to go, how many more months? Like just, you know, and not that things will go back to normal, they'll go back to different. Uh, I think 2021 will continue to challenge us and um, essentially help us continue to grow in ways that we never expected, uh, to grow as leaders, as staff, uh, for boards to continue to grow in their um, you know, maturity in, in terms of governing the organization. And uh, I also see virtual meetings actually making money. And I think back to the 90s when the big bad internet came and all the free content and you know competing with associations. Well, we're back in a new way. And I think that uh, I would say, don't be afraid to make money on your virtual meeting. Excellent, on that hopeful note. Unfortunately, we are all out of time. Uh, panelists, thank you, it's been a pleasure. There are some questions that uh, you know we received from the audience. We'll do our best to get those questions answered by the panelists and we'll revert back to everybody who attended today. Thank you everybody for being part of the session today. Stay safe, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.